Um, if there's something that you want you know, more added to, or if I'm not gearing this exactly to what you all need, there's so many disciplines in public health, so I want to make sure that I hit something for everybody. So ask your questions, I'll elaborate, I'll change the focus, we'll do whatever meets your all's needs. So some of the objectives, um, I just want to give you a history of what helicopter EMS is. Most people don't know, and, and the thought that they have in their mind of what we do as there's this team of three people that step off of, hel off of a helicopter and they have all these cool flight suits and they look really cool and that's just the best job ever. And that's really just not at all what we do. So, um, so I, I want everybody to have an understanding because we work so closely with public health as well as every other healthcare discipline. Uh, that I never realized when I started into this job. So we'll discuss the involvement of helicopter EMS. So PIMS, and I'm going to say that um, that word a lot during the lecture, is helicopter EMS. That's the air medical transport of patients. Um, so then we'll discuss a little bit of an overview of who we are, where I work, and what we do. And then the connection between PIMS agencies and other healthcare disciplines, and then the challenges that we face. Um, so. Hopefully, as you all get out into the workforce, you can help us with those challenges and we can help you all. So this is a picture of my baby, as I call it. Um, this is one of our aircraft, and this is, this is the one that we will talk primarily about today because this is the one closest to your region. So a little bit about my history and background, so you have a clue who's standing here talking to you and that I'm really not an expert at all. I'm just really lucky that they asked me to come and talk. Um, so, my career started at Clinch Valley Medical Center. Is anybody up here from Southwest Virginia? Where did you grow up? Uh, Kansas City. Okay, so we're a couple of counties over, but this is in Tazewell County. Carol. Okay, so, so you're familiar. So I started there at Clinch Valley, and I started working on a med search um, unit, because when I graduated nursing school in 1996, there were no nursing jobs. That's how different things are now. You couldn't find a job. And I wanted to work the ER. I went to nursing school thinking that I would learn how to take care of patients, and I came out of nursing school not having a clue how to take care of patients. I knew, you know, theory and history and substance and pharmacology, but as far as taking care of those medical emergencies that I went to nursing school to take care of, I had no idea. I went to a wonderful nursing school. It's just that philosophy is a little different than the true workplace. So I came out, finally found a job at Flinch Valley, started working on a med surge floor, worked five months on med surge and peace. At that time, you had to work a year before you would be considered to work in the ER. Not quite that way now. They're hiring nurses who are still in nursing school to work in the ER now. So I was just really lucky that I worked in a small hospital and was able to go to the ER. And, um, and it was tough. In that particular ER, there were two nurses, one doctor that worked a 24-hour shift. So he slept at night. He took care of your patients. He got up and decided the disposition of the patient, unless they were critical. And um, then we would wake him up when it was time. And so you really kind of had to know what you were doing. And I didn't know five months out of nursing school what I was doing at all. Um, so you often imagine straight out of your career and you start in the workplace in five months, you're really no expert. You're still learning what to do. So my shift partner on night shift, which was the worst shift to be on as a graduate because you were all alone. We had no pharmacy. We had one respiratory therapist in the hospital. You mixed all your own critical care drugs, but I learned a whole lot. But my partner then was a nurse who was a bit older than I was. I was 19 years old. And she says, you're going to have to get to the back bed. And she was really upset that she had to work with this young new graduate. And I thought, I just think you so bad that I'm going to succeed or die trying. So thankfully to her, she had a little bit of stuff under me. Um, and that <laughs> did help me along my path. So, um, so now, I, I spent about five years at Clinch Valley, and in 2000, I moved to Abington. No ER jobs in the Tri-Cities. Looked at all three of our trauma centers. There was nothing. They offered to me on a med search floor, and I thought, you know, I'll drive back and forth an hour each way as long as I get to work in the emergency room. I don't want to do the whole med search thing again uh, because I wanted emergency. So um, eventually, then I was hired at Bristol, um, and I was hired PRN because there were still no full-time jobs and it took me five months to get a full-time emergency room job. So that tells you in 17 years how the whole nursing shortage in the workplace has changed so very much. And as you all get inside the hospital, those of you that will work in a facility, you'll see what a drastic difference that is. So I started in the ER, worked as a staff nurse, then became an assistant clinical leader, started flying in January of 2001 with our Mental Life 2 program. 
um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. And quickly took off with that, that was where I wanted to be. That was my niche. I found my thing. Um, and then started flying full time. Still stayed in the ER for a little while part time um, until I had these two and then decided I was just going to fly all the time. Um, so then in 2007, the health system decided they wanted their own aircraft, and I'll tell you a little bit about that shortly as well. Um, and from then on out, it's been, it's been management. I'll fly a very occasional shift, but every time I decide I'm going to fly, something comes up, and then I don't get to fly. So I fly four or five shifts a year, unfortunately, um, but those are my two best shifts that I work in the entire year because it is so much fun. So, um, as the system director of flight services for Wilmot, we have two programs. One is the Wilmot One program. We have about 15 medical employees, four pilots, and two full-time mechanics there. The pilots and mechanics are not my employees, but we do oversee them. Um, and then on the MedFlight Two side, again, about 15 medical employees and about six pilots. Those pilots are Virginia State Police employees. So my background as far as education, um, I went to Pikeville then College, now it's Pikeville University, and got my associate's degree, went on and got my bachelor's at Old Dominion, came here and got my master's um, in nursing administration in 2003, a really long time ago that makes me feel terribly old as I'm talking to you all. Um, and then in the, in the interim, I decided to get my paramedic certification um, so that I could fly as a nurse paramedic. So I, I ended up getting the degree program at um, Southwest Virginia Community College in 2004. And I would be here in a PhD program except that I'm only four. So unfortunately, that's just not on the horizon right now. Um, so I serve on the Virginia State Governor's EMS Advisory Board, and I was appointed in August of 2011. Um, and then reappointed in, in 2014, so I'll rotate off of that in August. And that is essentially on the Virginia side because my programs are Virginia and Tennessee as far as my bases. Um, that is an advisory board that advises the governor on what he should do related to EMS. Um, and then I also work with the Southwest Virginia EMS Council Board of Directors, um, which is in Bristol. And then I'm on a couple of other state committees here. We've done many projects, and I'll go over some of those as we go on. And I just list those, not to say here's what I do by any means, but to say when I started into this, just like when you start into public health, you don't realize all of the avenues that you can take and why it's so important to be involved at the state level, at the regional level, at the local level, because it can change so much for your profession. I didn't realize this until, until I started doing this. I started attending these medevac meetings in like 2002, and I sat there thinking, what the heck? It, it was, and it's changed so much over the years, and I didn't realize the importance of them, but year after year as I kept going to that and understanding the state processes and how it truly affects us at our local level, it is so very important to be educated on that. Something that is really outside of my expertise is I serve on the Health System Institutional Review Board, which is every research project that comes through our health system. I sit on that review board to review the projects and the renewal of the projects, which is terribly interesting. Um, it has nothing to do with air medicine. I did put a project through two years ago. Um, but it just covers every facet of care, particularly cardiology and oncology for our health system. Um, but, but it is really interesting and something that I would encourage you all to look at, particularly if we're going to go into epidemiology and some of those other, um, some of those public health fields that can deal a lot with the research side. So this is who I really am, and they're already fussing at me for a couple of pictures that I put up here. So, um, so this this is outside the workplace. So three girls, um, a husband up there. When we're not working, we're on the softball field or dancing or um, volleyball or something. We're on the go all the time. Um, we we don't let a lot of grass grow there at our case, at our house for sure. So great things in business are never done by one person; they're done by a team of people. And I live by that every day. So as you go out into the workforce, if you think, this is me, and you're independent, and, and everything is kind of about you, which is a lot of time our philosophy, our philosophy, particularly when we're young, um, it's really not. And that is something that I saw, not just in the ER, but as I progressed through my career, there's nothing that I do on a daily basis that is me. It is all about my team. I look nice because I have a great team. Projects get done because I have a great team. And I'm constantly calling and saying, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me do this? Um, and without those folks there, we're nothing. 
Then without the team of providers pre hospital, this shows one of our local fire departments loading a patient. We're nothing. I have to have that team throughout, or we are nothing. We're a team of three in the aircraft. None of us can function without the other. So nothing is truly independent in the workforce and in your profession. I'll just challenge you to keep that team philosophy as you go through. So what is helicopter EMS? It's the air transportation <laughs> for certain persons requiring specialized medical crew and rapid transport due to a medical illness or injury. And the initial medical care can occur on the side of a road or a community hospital. So it essentially says you have a sick or injured patient, they go there in a helicopter in an airplane, and the whole um, goal of it is speed. That's why we're there. Um, particularly in the county that we work in, Sullivan County and Washington County, we're not there because of our skill. Our paramedics on the ground have the exact, exact same skill as I do, and as my nurses and my paramedics do. We are very fortunate to have the EMS system that we do in those two counties. In some of our outlying counties, not so much. They may need our skill and our care as much as they do our speed. Every county and locality differs across um, Northeast and Southeast of Virginia as far as the amount of care, the level of care that they need to get. So essentially, if we fly really sick and really injured people really fast. So air medical transport involved for military experience, just as most things in emergency um, health care. <coughs> Um, initially used fixed wing transportation in World War II, um, increased the use of helicopters in the training conflict. It was all about rapid, trans uh, rapid trauma response systems that were built around helicopters and they were fully deployed in the Vietnam conflict. Um, the Maryland State Police became the first civilian agency to transport a critically injured patient in 1970. So if you really think about that, that's not a whole long time ago that we've been doing air medical care. Um, so it is still considered a relatively new tool in trauma care, even though you all are young and you're going to do so because that's forever ago. Um, it really wasn't as far as the involvement. So the first civilian hospital-based medical helicopter service was in 1972 um, in Denver, Colorado, and they have a fixed wing as well as rotor wing. So fixed wing is airplane, rotor wing is helicopter. So air medical service programs were initially owned and operated by trauma centers. So if a, if a hospital decided it wanted its own helicopter, like Wilmot or Mountain State, um, UT, any of our health systems, then they essentially had to own and operate the system. It was very expensive. A lot of them ended up buying their own helicopters, millions of dollars. Um, they staffed it either with nurse, nurse, or nurse physician. Probably not the smartest thing then, because most of our nurses aren't used to working in the pre-hospital environment. And it wasn't just transport from hospital to hospital, it's scene response, like picking patients up from the middle of the interstate from car accidents and taking them to trauma centers. So that has evolved over time. Um, we operate on a physician level scope of practice, which means that the skills that we could do in the aircraft are at a physician's level. That's a big draw to my employees because sometimes they feel like they're in a little bit of a box when they're inside the hospital or inside their ambulance and they want to do more. We're very type A, it depends on high strength group of individuals. Um, and that's who is drawn to our profession. So we want to do more, we want to do as much as we can. So we perform skills, and I'll go over those in a little bit, inside the aircraft that you can't perform anywhere else because it's outside your scope of practice. Um, then, the aircraft were focused on air facility high acuity. They weren't going out to the field and getting you know, Mr. Bob, who, who overturned his tractor and was critically injured underneath his tractor, they were going to ICUs and transporting back to larger facilities or ERs. Um, so we provide rapid transport, um, extensive experience in advanced health care. We can't hire new nurses or new paramedics because we're a team of two on there. We, we have to have that clinical knowledge to be able to operate um, and function at the level that we function. We also um, provide ALS or advanced life support skills, which may or may not include. Um, and, and I'll go over just a few of these. RSI means that we can give drugs, put patients to sleep, paralyze their bodies, and intubate them and put them on a ventilator, just as you do in the operating room. We can do surgical airways, which is <laughs> kind of like a tracheostomy. Um, we can put needles in their chest, which is like a little mini chest tube. Um, we have little ventilators on the aircraft. We have little IV pumps. And everything on an aircraft, we, we can only lift the aircraft underneath maximum gross weight. So whatever that weight of that aircraft is, we can't lift off of the helipad if we weigh more than that. 
So everything that is on the aircraft has to be little, and we have to know the weight of everything, including our crew members. And, and my medical crew members have to weigh two container less. And that's just because if I have more weight than that, that's less patient weight that I can take, it's less supplies I can take, um, and less equipment that I can take. So we're bound by weight on everything. Um, we can manage a number of complications in the aircraft. We can give thrombolytics for our stroke patients and our um, MIs. And then some aircraft do specialize in QMP, Q transports, the little neonates and the pediatrics. We will do pediatrics. We do not do neonates that are less than 30 days. So there's four types of helicopter EMS programs. We're not all alike. Um, most everyone in our region is different, which you wouldn't think in a small region. So you have the traditional, which means that, the, that a health system either owns their own aircraft or they do the patient billing. So there's a lot more money tied up in those by health systems. Um, they typically get a little bit more money because they're doing all the patient billing. But that means you have to have very specialized um, PFS personnel, patient financial services personnel, to be able to do the collections and very specialized finance um, personnel inside your health system to know exactly how to build these because your pre-hospital and EMS transports are not built anything like a, a patient inside of a hospital. Um, you have hybrid programs, which is what we have, and that essentially means there's equal risk. So the helicopter company has as much risk as what the um, hospital does. Sometimes they pay you for a patient transported, sometimes it's a lump sum. There's too much money, though, that goes both ways. We give a statement to the helicopter company, they give the health system a statement. You have community base, which means it has nothing to do with a hospital. These are aircraft that a helicopter comes in, they put them there, that's who operates them. They will take them to the local facilities, but a hospital has no hand in the operation of, of those helicopters. And then we have some other models where some health systems will merely pay a marketing fee to have their colors flown by the aircraft, but they really have nothing to do with the aircraft. It's just a nice flying billboard. cost them a lot of money. Um, but the marketing um, tool for that in their region is worth it for them. So all kinds of different models even within these subsets. Um, most of what you see here, though, will be those hybrid models. So HIM services provide sea response. That's when our paramedics um, will say we need a helicopter for a bad accident, car accident, um, tractor rollover, um, somebody who is having a heart attack that lives way out that's going to take them an hour ground time to transport to the hospital. Um, Interfacility critical care transport, that is um, transferring patients out of a hospital, whether it be the ER, ICU, we've taken them straight off the OR table to go to a trauma center. We did that actually last month, was our last time we did that. Um, NICU and PQ transports, um, organ transplants, so we can go and pick up an organ and take it to meet a fixed wing. Um, blood, um, we have taken supplies hospital to hospital before that are critical that they need. Um, and when those things happen, we don't ask a lot of questions. We can figure out a better process after. We can figure out why something happened. We can figure those out later. But in the meantime, when somebody needs something fast, then we're going to respond and help them with that need. Those times are very, very far in between. Search and rescue and police missions. The only aircraft that, um, the medical aircraft that you all see in your region, we will do searches and we we'll limit those to 30 minutes. So if there's a hunter that's lost in the woods, We'll go out and search for him, but we'll do it for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to call our police-based aircraft in, such as Tennessee Highway Patrol or our MEPLAY program, and they take over the true search and rescue. Our MEPLAY program is the only program that is not military-based um, that does rescue work, and we, we do a decent amount of rescue work. Um, we have a hoist on both of our aircraft where we can actually hoist patients up. We've done three or four since November, and that's pretty high volume in this region for police missions. Police work, um, Tennessee Highway Patrol as well as Virginia State Police do police work, and that was something that, um, that is something that our med flight crew that I'll talk to you about has to do, that our Vermont One crew doesn't. We go out on police missions. I have circled for hours and hours and hours in a helicopter looking for the bank car, looking for the lost person, chasing somebody if there's a high speed. Um, pursuit on the interstate, we would have to respond to that. And some of those can be really exciting. Some of those can be really boring as you're circling for hours. 
but they have such a great mission for that. And our medical providers are on those um, missions. So we're the only aircraft that you will see medical personnel, our nurses and paramedics, on the aircraft doing those police missions. So some of the changes that have affect what we do. Um, you've seen a lot of hospitals close, convert um, to critical access hospitals. That has affected how we operate. We had Lee <coughs> County in our region that closed. That meant that all of those patients that we were transporting from hospital to hospital, now they're either traveling further to go to a different hospital, we're picking them up from on the scenes. It changes the way that we do business. Um, corporate organizations and financing um, of air medical services have undergone change. One of the biggest things that we see, and this will be on a challenge later, is nobody really understands what we do, and they certainly don't understand the money that it takes to do what we do. Um, so that has really affected and put a lot of services out of business over the years. Um, we've seen a huge shift from the traditional model, which is the hospital base, they're doing the building, um, over to the community base. A lot of hospitals, University of Kentucky was one of them, they got rid of their aircraft. So those patients are now served by a community model. And a lot of health systems go, why do we need that expense? There's going to be an aircraft here, the patients are going to be taken care of the board pharmacy, and we're going to get the patients. And it's like, it's different. It is so different because those community-based models can carry the drugs that they want to carry. They can operate the way they want. They can take care of the patients they want. As long as they're underneath the state guidelines and meeting those minimum requirements, we can't make them do anything else. So if we don't like the care, if we want different drugs, if we want different procedures, there's nothing that we can do. For instance, on my aircraft, I can add a drug like this. If, if my medical director says, we want this drug added, I can literally write a protocol, go to the pharmacy, take it to my aircraft, and it's just that easy. If we need equipment, then we can ask for that equipment. Sometimes it takes some time, but there's huge benefit by being associated with the health system. And certainly, if we don't take care of the patients like they want us to, we know it's really bad. Um, States have assumed regulatory oversight of medical aspects of air medical system, including communications, dispatch equipment, and supplies. Every state oversees um, every EMS agency, including aircraft, are licensed by the state that they operate in. So we're licensed in Virginia and Tennessee. So that means we can do point to point in those states, even though we operate in a lot of other states. Those are our two bases. They can tell us Tennessee is very, very strict on communications and dispatch. And 90% of my annual audit deals with communications and dispatch. Whereas 90% of my audit in Virginia, which is every two years, deals with personnel and education and training. So their focus is very different. So who are we as a service and what do we provide? So this is um, our first base. This is our Mid Flight 2 program. This is the largest aircraft that you're going to see in the region. This is an EC-145 twin engine, two patient capable. Um, we can actually take three medical providers and two pilots in this aircraft should we choose to. Um, so this is a partnership between the Virginia State Police and Vermont Health System. It consists, um, the State Police provide the aircraft, they provide the pilots, all the fuel, all the maintenance, all the hangar. Walmart provides at about $700,000, $750,000 a year, all the medical crew, medical supplies, medical, medical equipment, all of our flight suits, our gloves, our helmets, um, name tags, anything to do with the medical personnel and taking care of the patients from the medical aspect. We've been they have over 20 years um, of medical experience. This is a whole lot to be on the slide. This is really just for me to remember some of the things to tell you. And this is what we do to educate inside our health system continuously. So that program started in the spring of 1987. And in 1987, um, the state police reached out and they took volunteer paramedics from Bristol Lysenic Crew. And it was one paramedic, one pilot. And that's the way it stayed until January the 1st of 1989 when Wilmot, well, then Bristol Memorial picked up those paramedics and started paying them. For, for, so for that first two years, it was just volunteer, just like some of the volunteer rescue agencies that you see today. Um, in 1984, we added nurses to the mix and really just kind of rocked the paramedics world going, now I've been by myself for all these years and now I have to work with this nurse. Um, and there were some growing pains, but it's such a wonderful relationship now. Um, Let's see, the primary dispatch center um, is at Bristol Regional Medical Center, and that's where our dispatchers sit, and they flight follow the aircraft. Dispatching of aircraft is so important because they tell us where to go, they give us updates on our patients, and if something were to happen to us, they, they help us to find help. 
because if we're crashed on a mountain, somebody doesn't always know where we are or what's happening, so they track us continu continuously so that if we need help, they can get us to that place. Their backup aircraft is about 4 to 7, which is a single engine more efficient capable. So our other program is Walmart 1, um, and that's located at Bristol Motor Speedway. The program was designed, developed, and built in 2007. Um, at that time, I was the chief flight nurse at our med flight program, and the system decided, Dr. Salute's idea, and decided that he wanted aircraft, and he said, you're going with this company, it's going to be at Tacoma, and I said, yes, sir. And so we were at Tacoma about a year and a half, and then we moved. So we're in the middle of, the, of our um, service area now, um, which is the very best place for us to be. We're located at Bristol Motor Speedway. Um, if you take the south entrance, we're right there on the driver's helipad. That puts us pretty much in the middle of the county, but it gets us in the middle of all of our hospitals as well as all of our region. Kentucky, North Carolina, West Virginia, Tennessee, Virginia, everywhere that we need to be, we're, we're pretty much in the middle there. Um, we actually started transporting patients at the um, spring race. It was March the 21st of 2008. It was a really busy year. It's hard for me to forget. Um, so you'll see on our accelerator it says um, official medical provider for Mr. Motor Speedway, which means we're based there. We're the only, we have the only um, motor speedway that has an aircraft based at their location. But then when they have their large races in now April and August, as well as the drags in June, we provide an aircraft um, under NASCAR regulations to do all of the response for the NASCAR drivers. And then when the drivers are not on the track, then we respond to, to the um, folks who are attending the race before and after the race. And that's really where we get our the most of our responses um, from, from people who have um, encountered heat or a little bit too much drinking, walk a little too far, got run over by a car, or the golf cart, happens all the time. So that's, that's the most of our responses there. Um, but we do have a, a great working relationship there with the Speedway. So the company that we use, because we have that helicopter company that provides our aircraft, our pilots, our mechanics, and we're very fortunate to have four full-time pilots, two full-time mechanics for one aircraft. You typically don't have two full-time mechanics for one aircraft. Um, so we chose PHI Air Medical. They have about 30 years of air medical experience, um, 250 aircraft in 16 states, they get with their medical. We didn't choose the largest company. We didn't choose the smallest company. We chose what we thought was the safest company. They're not the cheapest. Um, but we get what we need, which is safety and ex exceptional customer support. Um, we work so collaboratively with PHI that it's like we work together. And it's been like that for many years. Um, so we're very, very fortunate to have them. I, I really cannot see their prices enough, and that never happens. You will never hear, hear a medical person from a medical base go, I love our vendor. There's always some customer support issues, and PHI is wonderful. Um, they were the first company to install night vision goggles, and I bar all aircraft, we'll talk about that in a little bit. They got the first safety, um, Vision Zero Award in 2007, and that's because they put night vision goggles throughout their aircraft before the NTSB said you have to do this, or the FAA said you have to do this. They, um, they're they very proactive with their safety procedures. They won Vision Zero again this year. Um, in December, we went down to Charlotte, and they were awarded that, um, that precious award, and it was because of their safety education. And they not only provide that in the company, they say any helicopter in the company that wants it, we give it to you. It's free because we want we, we don't want people dying in helicopter accidents anymore. Um, to me, that's exceptional and incredible. So a little bit on fact sheet. We operate under Part 135 within the FAA. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we're staffed with one pilot, one flight nurse, one, one flight paramedic. The state of Tennessee says that I can fly nurse nurse. The state of Virginia says that I can fly medic medic. Both say that I can fly nurse medic. Um, almost all of my nurses are duly certified as paramedics, which is the goal that I want them to have because nurses coming out of hospitals have no idea what paramedics do, but truly, in the field, stepping off of an ambulance, taking care of that patient that has nothing done for them. So I want them to have that understanding. I'm married to a paramedic, I'll tell you I'm not a real paramedic. I wasn't on the ambulance for years, if he's right, I'm not. Uh, but I have an understanding of what they do, and I've been in the field so long that I get it, and I have at least the knowledge. Our primary aircraft is a Bell 4, a seven single engine, one patient capable. We switched aircraft three years ago. We had a big pulse of an aircraft, two patient. Um, you could 
literally stand like this in the back of the aircraft. It, it was amazing. But the thing was also really heavy. It was older because they didn't make that aircraft anymore. It cost us a lot of maintenance time. And it was kind of like going from the SUV to the Corvette. So we gave up a lot of space. We gave up an engine, but man, we can fly fast and efficient now. So we had to choose what was okay for us and what was within our mission. And being a new program, we wanted the twin engines. We had a lot of new pilots who came here. So we wanted that extra safety. Two engines really hurt seven lives in air medical, in the air medical world. We're dying because we're flying in the mountains. We're dying because we're hitting wires. We're dying because we're complacent. We're not typically dying because we lose an engine, although I'll show you another example of how I'm a little bit wrong with that a little bit. But most are not dying because they have one engine versus two. Um, with this efficient aircraft, we can fly further, we can fly longer, we can take patients further, we can go to UVA, we can go to Vanderbilt, we can go to Duke, Augusta, to the Burns Center, Cincinnati, um, Atlanta. So we can, we can service our region and our health system much, much more by having this smaller, more efficient aircraft. And they're so reliable. It's such a wonderful aircraft. So this is our primary aircraft. Um, the backup down here, all of PHI's community aircraft and backup aircraft are black and yellow. And they're black and yellow so that they can be seen. When we first started our program, um, the DM2 players and I were driving to the workshop for the EMS and COSAM, and we were trying to figure out what our um, paint job was going to be. And we had gotten a few mock-ups from uh, Mark and Ann. One was like blue and green, right? One was blue and white. Some had a little bit of green. And I was kind of leaning toward the white. And this aircraft flew over us, and she goes, who is that? And I said, I don't know, I can't really see it. All the white's kind of blending in with the sunshine. She goes, exactly. She got blue green. <laughs> so I'm glad in the end that she did get that. Um, but it worked. So we um, service a 60 nautical mile radius of Bristol, Tennessee. That is to pick up patients. That's about 30 um, minutes flight time. Every nautical mile, you can um, half that, and that is um, that's the, the time that it takes us. So 60 nautical miles is 30 minutes. We fly about 140, 150 miles an hour. We burn about 0.8 gallons of fuel per minute. Um, in the aircraft that we did have, it was about 1.1 gallons of fuel. So every minute of flight, we drop about six pounds or so of weight, which is really important because if we get on scene and have a really big patient, then we have to sit there and burn all of this fuel and drop that weight before we can leave the patient because remember we can't take off over max gross. So our pilots have to do a lot of math all the time, um, which is not something that you would expect that a pilot is doing all the time, um, but it is constant math. So we start as Tennessee with the Kentucky, North Carolina, and we take patients to all those facilities that I think this way. We do scene response, air facility critical care, as well as ER. Our critical care and ER transfers are about 85% of what we do, 80 to 85%, depending on what time of year it is. So we're weighted a lot heavier with that than scene response, and we get some severe sick, sick people, um, really sick people. So services that we provide are similar to what I remember earlier. We do all of those ALS skills fast, we need to be fast. Um, and that is preached to us. If, if an EMS agency calls an aircraft and that paramedic has to sit there and wait on the aircraft, bet your bottom dollar they're going to cancel us because he can drive. So he can get a diesel and get to the hospital faster than he can sit there on scene with a bad patient and say, We're going to sit on With us being in Sullivan County, when we do Sullivan County scene responses, we have to work a little more efficient and smarter versus the traditional way. So if, if our paramedics respond to something that sounds bad, they will put the aircraft on standby. Typically, standby means we go and sit in the aircraft and we get ready to lift. So, it's for standbys, um, for us, that means we get in the air. That means we burn up a lot of money, we burn up a lot of fuel, we burn up a lot of flight time, because about 40% of the time or so we're canceled for those missions because they get on scene and realize this patient really isn't as bad as what we thought it would be. But that's okay. We would rather have that cost and be there for the patients than not have that cost and be sitting there and be canceled 100% of the time or 80% of the time. So that is a service that we provide to our EMS agencies. We go on standby, we lift, we're not going to be flying overhead. I don't care if we land in front of you, if that patient does not need flown, cancel us. Somebody else may need us. Don't tie us up with a non-critical patient. So dispatch centers can call us, EMS can call us, fire, law enforcement, and then ask for your local guidelines. This is our local EMS agency here, and this is um, on our helipad at our base at 
there's no better to be like. So we tell them to call when there's multi system trauma and acute medical condition requiring rapid transport. That has changed over the years. 16 years ago, when I started flying, you didn't call for strokes and MIs and shortness of breath, pediatric patients with trachs having complications. That just didn't happen. It was all about trauma. Now we're flying many, many, many more medical patients from scene responses. We also tell them index of suspicion. Sometimes our paramedics will go out and go, this doesn't look so bad, but my guy says it's bad. If his guy says he's bad, he's an experienced provider, it's going to be bad. Um, sometimes you don't know. You can get a really mangled car and think that the patient is going to be bad, and then you get them out and they're really not. Um, the body can take forces that are just unbelievable. Um, but if they suspect that it's going to be bad, they can always cancel us. If we fly something that's not bad, that's okay. We will learn from that. Or when there's limited resources. Anytime there's poor ground, tra ground transport options and we run into this, um, particularly in our remote counties, they can have two and a half hours to get to a hospital. They may fly patients that are much less critical than what we do for Washington County and Sullivan County and Carter County. Um, anytime there's environmental conditions that, that does not allow the EMS agency to get there, the helicopter can. Uh, Dr. Turner is our medical director. We have to have a physician that oversees our program because we work off of his license. He's an ER physician at Bristol and Hudson Valley. He was a paramedic. Um, he was actually working on an ambulance one day in Memphis when he got the call that he was accepted into med school and had a call and said, I'm sorry, I'll have to call you back. And he was like, I know, I'm not going to get into med school now. I just hung up on him. Luckily, they understood. He got into med school. Um, he flies with us on occasion. He's very, very involved, but he understands what we do, which most physicians um, don't always understand what we do. This is him down here writing by himself, unfortunately. EMS week is every May, and we get a bicycle ride to um, honor our fallen EMS providers that have either fallen over the prior year or in years past. Unfortunately, in 2009, I believe it was, we lost one of our crew members as he was driving to work to our Tacoma base. He was driving down the interstate on Interstate 81, and the driver was driving the wrong way, and he hit head on. In his flight suit, when the flight crew responds to that accident, and he's dead. We have to fly the right driver who just killed my team member. So needless to say, we're a little passionate about that. We're a little passionate about substance abuse and um, drunk driving. So he rides many, 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 many miles every May in honor of Earl um, and his memory to us. So earlier I spoke a little bit about Part 91 and Part 135. So different. Our med flight program is a Part 91 which says the FAA has two sets of rules for medical helicopters. One is Part 91, which is public safety police. The other one is Part 135, which is everybody else. So if you're not police, public safety, then you fall under the Part 135. They're very different. We were the only health system nationally that I knew that operated a Part 91 and a Part 135 until about this time last year when um, BCU in Richmond, Virginia picked up our med flight one program. We were on the phone all the time with them going, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? Because they had their own flight program and now they're providing nurses for the Med Flight 1 program. Um, my crew members only have two that switch bases. They're different. They're different philosophies. That Part 91 philosophy is that police philosophy. Very different than our Part 135, who we have so many little sins exhausting. Um, Part 91, our pilots can work 24-hour duty shifts, there's no restrictions. If they have a crash, they don't even have to call the NTSB. There, there's really not a lot of oversight. There's no maintenance oversight, there's no route service oversight. Um, they can fly in 500-foot ceilings, which means from the ground to the first cloud level, layer is 500 feet. It's not a whole lot when you're in a helicopter. And one mile visibility. So we only have to see 500 feet up and one mile in front of us going at 150 miles an hour. That's that's our standards. Uh, part 135 is very, very different. We have minimums whether we're flying locally, whether we're flying cross country. We have to be so, the public has to be so many feet above the highest obstacle. It is exhausting how many rules that we have, but they're there for our safety as well. Our pilots can work 12 hour duty shifts. They can only fly eight um, hours within that duty time. They can only extend their flight time by two hours post. So if they're going to be on a flight, for, for after their duty shift is over, they have to get approval. They can only extend their duty time by two hours. 
which means if we can't be at a receiving facility in that amount of time, we can't transport the patient. We have to wait until another pilot comes in. So safety is so important in what we do. And this, this is a depiction of hands crashes over the years. Um, you can see there was a huge spike in 2007. Still some horrible spikes there. We hit another one in 2013. It's been all over the media if you turned on. Um, any kind of news channel over the last few years, you see a helicopter crash here, a helicopter crash there, almost to the point that it's like, no, we don't have a helicopter crash. Unfortunately, we are complacent with it, and we didn't used to be. So we're going, why are we crashing? What's happening that's causing us to crash? Um, when in past years, there weren't that many. So this shows by year um, the no total number of accidents, and then the total number of fatal accidents of those, and then the number of fatalities. So you can see, I mean, in 14, we had eight accidents, two were fatal, and it killed six people. So two of those may have been a fatal crash, but we killed six people in two crashes, and that was six people that should not have died. We're going out to save people, not to die, while we're doing that. But unfortunately, that is where it is and has gone over the years. So why? Why are we crashing? What's causing it? The emergency nature of the flight. If you're in a hurry, there's an emergency at your house, and you're calling on one more, and you're going here and there, are you really with it and paying attention to what you're doing? Are you running over and kicking the dog and smelling your coke and trying to do these things and not really paying attention to what's going on? That happens, unfortunately, in our business. That's why we need experienced providers doing what we do that can stay calm, respond to these um, incidents, and not get into the adrenaline rush emergency side of it. And the control landing sites. We're hitting wires. We're hitting, you can't see wires. Even with night vision goggles, you cannot see power lines from the air. So unless we catch it in our light, as we're landing in the dark, or somebody tells us where a power line is, we're there mercy. I had an incident 10 years or so ago. We were landing on scene, and there was a policeman there saying, there's wire, there's wire. And I'm going, there's no wire, there's no wire. We circled for 10 minutes looking for this wire, and he kept telling us it was there, and we are calling him a liar. Thank God he kept persisting, there's a wire, there's a wire, there's a wire. And it took us 10 minutes of looking for the wire to find the wire. So when we're going into these landing zones, if I don't have firemen on scene that are saying, or policemen, or first responders, search and rescue personnel, that are helping us control our landing zone, that's huge risk for us as we're landing. Animals, people, people are our, are our greatest obstacles. It is exhausting the amount of people that we have to pull away from the aircraft when we've landed accident planes because it's like they're not fearful. They're just walking to the aircraft like they need to be there. Um, drones. Two, three years ago, we didn't think about drones around the aircraft. Now they're out seeing what we want to see, and <laughs> there's drones flying around. Um, a, a partner of ours in Roanoke actually had one to, one to fly over their aircraft on, a, on an accident scene. Here's a drone. Those things can be deadly. It's like a bird. Birds can kill us if they if they go into our um, engine intake system. So drones are deadly to us. High adrenaline, as I just talked about, EMS firefighters, turnover statistics. It is all the time that we're doing training. Firemen, it's a revolving door. EMS is a revolving door. Hospitals, it's a revolving door. So we can train today, and in two months, it's a whole different set of people that we're retraining. So the experts aren't staying there to keep us safe. Um, the number of people on scene at a bad accident, you will drive down the interstate and see a truck trailer on its side, and it's like there's 50 people there. Everybody has to sit, and then everybody has to stop and look, and then there's cars driving by, and they all have to stop and block traffic because we're all looking to see what happened over there. You know, we have EMS personnel getting hit by cars because they're trying to look at the accident and not paying attention to where they're going. Um, hot loading, which means that we load the patient while the aircraft is running. We can either do that cold, which is the aircraft shut down, or hot. Our nature, our business is speed, right? We have to be as speedy as we can. So we're going, want to be safe, go fast. Want to be safe, go faster. So I'm constantly telling my people, we need to be more efficient. we got to go faster, but do it really safely. Well, there's a fine line between safe and fast. Our goal from the time our phone rings until our helicopter lifts off the ground is 10 minutes. That's pretty fast for a pilot to take the call, check the weather, call EOC, accept the flight, get your stuff, go to start up, do all your safety procedures, 10 minutes. If we're going to a scene response from the time we land until the time we're in the air, 10 minutes or less. That gives you about six minutes for the patient. If we're going to a hospital and it's a critical patient, such as an MRI or a stroke that's going back to the cath lab, 15 minutes. 
so they can land on a hospital, walk in, get their patient, their paperwork, load them, and be in the air in 15 minutes. They're literally ready to be able to do that. ICU patients, I want them out in 20 minutes. So I'm going, be careful, go run, go really fast. And um, so that causes increased risk because what happens when we hurry? We're not paying attention. Weather, this morning was the perfect example. At my house, it was awful. Absolutely awful. And then I drive through Western Tennessee, there's snow, there's snow on the road, and then there's not the snow like anywhere. People are going, why can't you respond to the aircraft? Well, that aircraft has weather restrictions. So weather is a huge, huge obstacle to us. We can go out in the weather, we can get stuck in the clouds, we can get stuck in fog, and if we can't see, we're not flying. So that is that is a huge risk for um, um, crashes for us. Competition, unfortunately we compete for our patients. Complacency, it is, it's, a, it's a fact that we will do our walk-arounds on the aircraft, and we're so used to walking around doing the aircraft, there can be a latch open, there can be you know, a cord hanging out, and we don't even see it, because we're used to looking at it all the time, but we look right past it. And then human error, and quite honestly, that's the biggest thing that kills people, is we just make errors for humans. Each main rotor blade typically weighs about 100 pounds and makes 300 or 400 rotations. That can be devastating if somebody goes into it. So we have many safety features. We have an EFC, which is our kind of mini air traffic control. We have this matrix, we have normalized dispatching. We have a satellite that tracks us every six seconds and tells our dispatchers where we are. We have night vision goggles. We have very stringent training programs. Our pilots have to do two auto rotations every year, which means he gets up to a certain altitude, cuts off the engine, and he has to kind of glide like an airplane down to the runway. Um, and that is really important because not every helicopter company does that. So our safety and things that we have to think about is the way we dress, we're going to fire retarded gear so that we don't catch fire in case we're going to crash, our training, survival, fuel, terrain, crash recovery procedures, weather shopping, which means somebody stuck in one an aircraft and we'll all say we can't come for weather and about the fifth aircraft they call, none of us can come for weather, please stop calling. Um, we have a three to go, one to say no, which is means that at any time inside that aircraft, somebody can say, I'm not comfortable, don't want to go, we go back, because there's a reason they're not comfortable. Pilot blinding, this is Greg, our lead pilot here. When he gets a call, he knows that he's going from Tacoma to Holston Valley. He doesn't know if it's a five-day-old or if it's an 85-year-old, because if we know it's a five-day-old, what do we do? We're going to go. doesn't matter what that weather is. We're going to try to get that baby because we got to save a life. Well, trying to save that life may cost us our lives. So they do not know what they're going after. They just know the hospitals that they're going to. The NTSB has given us many, many, many mandatory um, restrictions over the last few years, like dispatch procedures, mismanagement practices. Um, we have to have um, terrain systems in our aircraft that says when you get close to the ground, it goes beep, 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 and tells you that you're close to the ground, it tells you when aircraft are close to you. Those things cost billions of dollars. That's why we're so um, costly to operate but they're there for our safety. Um, my team sometimes look at, looks at this and goes, can you stop showing that and making us relive this? No, I won't. I show this to everybody. Our team had this incident June the 3rd of last year. So we were part of that human error, and we lost an aircraft. Um, and I do this to teach because this is why we go in and teach our EMS and our fire officials what to do. Um, so on this particular day, we responded to Johnson County, we picked up a same patient, this um, man that was in a car accident. We load him, we're lifting off, we're about 100 feet off the ground. The aircraft goes pop, puts out a big bunch of smoke, falls to the ground. That is deadly. We should have lost three crew members and a patient this day. Thank God we did. That is honest to God the only reason they survived. Thank God he had mercy on us. Because what happened was, as this pop happens, and our pilot sees his gauges fall, as he gets ready to say, we're landing, he gets wear out, and then he goes, hang on. So it takes him, what, two seconds or so to fall 100 feet out of the ground? Well, as he's falling 100 feet out of the ground, he's going toward a fire truck, where there's firemen, and an ambulance, where there's paramedics. So what he does is pulls the aircraft and he veers to the right, should have never happened, and he lands it, should have never happened. He should have never landed an aircraft on 100 feet falling outside, should have never been able to turn it. He should have never landed it upright on the bailing. 
None of that should have happened. But because we go out and do all the training that we do, the firemen and the EMS agencies knew what to do. Because my people did what they were supposed to do, which meant they braced, they were in pressure position. Everybody has on their seatbelts, the doors are closed. Equipment is where it should be. Because many times we'll load our patients, we'll throw that 25-pound trauma back in. If you fall out of the sky at 100 feet like this, what happens with a 25-pound trauma bag? Straight into my head. We could die because of those things. We have a 30-pound monitor. If that thing went into their face, that's damage. So everybody did exactly what they were supposed to do. Complacency didn't heal. Human error caused this because the mechanic, not ours, at this, we suspicion, this is what we think happened. This little bitty piece that was inside the compressor failed. It had, had maintenance on it at some point, and there was an error made in this little bitty piece inside the compressor, inside the engine. So when the little piece fails, the compressor fails, the engine fails, you fall. It was one of those things, unfortunately, nobody could have done anything to prevent this. But training on the front end said that one was. This is why we choose the company we do. So this is our lead pilot who was able to miraculously land this thing, and he got a, a um, national award in December for EMS Pilot of the Year because of what he did. Um, this is our paramedic that was on the aircraft that day, and our nurse unfortunately wasn't able to go to the event uh, to be awarded with. So flight preparation, we have to think of all of these things as we're preparing for a flight, um, many of which I've already talked about. Things that I look for in crew members, communicator, attitude. If they don't have the right attitude, not okay. A bad attitude means they're not doing their safety procedures, they're not following their protocols, they're not being nice to the customers. We don't go back. One crew member can cost me my business, literally my entire business. Um, we have to have a safe culture, safety focus, integrity, um, be good decision makers. They won't always make the right decisions, just make a decision and um, have the best interest of the patient in mind. We have lots of oversight of what we do um, from the state level to the FAA to the regional to the, to the local. Everybody is telling us how we should do our job better. Okay. So public health. So how does all of this tie into you? You're probably sitting there going, this is great, but where do I come into this? If you end up in a hospital, having the knowledge of the stuff that's going on. It is constantly that I'm going to the hospital explaining what we do, how we do it, why we do it, what the money is for. Having the knowledge of all of the services that your, that your hospital and your health system provides will be so beneficial. I work with Sullivan County Health Department all the time. I would have never guessed that. Dr. May is a, is a dear, dear friend of mine, and I'm constantly calling saying, can you help me with this question? So infectious disease reporting. We transported a patient with 106 rectal temperature class, or 108, I'm sorry, 108 rectal temperature that should never happen. Never, ever should that happen. My public health officials are my friends at that point as I'm going, what happened, how do we do, what, how do we treat, you know, our crew members. Um, you know, we have a couple of outbreaks of meningitis right now. That's good for me to know. Our public health officials give me that information so that I can better prepare to fly an extra kit or so this month with meningitis. Um, I can stop up on my supply, infectious disease education, community education, that whole seatbelt use, injury prevention, the alcohol use, we can do um, education together. Protocol, um, I look to my health department to say, can you help me with this protocol? I don't know what to do with this infectious disease. How do I handle this? How do I take care of my people? Um, research, we use the research that they provide. I'm in two meetings or so every month with our public health officials as we talk about um, response to mass casualty. How do we do that? How do we do that together? We have people in our health departments that oversee that. How do we respond? They need to understand what we do. They know how to call us. So our work has crossed all the time. We're on regional communities and we collaborate much more than what I would have ever guessed that we do. And we can do a lot of collaborative education and data reporting between each other. This is some education that we did with several disciplines back in November about drones, saying, please like the drones. Those are even education that when you're out there doing the seatbelt education and all of these other things, you can educate. That helps us. We can help you on your injury prevention, your infectious disease education. So challenge us and where we need your help as well. There's huge scrutiny over what we do in the media. Having knowledge is power. If I understand what you do, you understand what I do, we can 
kind of eliminate a lot of those um, rumors. Um, PTSD is huge for us, and, and that's something that public health needs to be aware of. We fly the sickest to the most injured patients. We fly for 24 hour shifts. We're exhausted. We go home and we take it out on our families. We need that um, oversight. We need counseling, unfortunately, because we're only good for so long. Um, we need your help with legislation. Some of our legislation calls us both passed. We can be a voice together. Um, education, lack, there's a lack of understanding from other health disciplines of what we do, and there's a lack of knowledge on our part of what you all do. Strategic planning, particularly with those mass casualty incidents that we can do together. Um, that's no longer futuristic. And as you go out into the workplace, strategic planning is for 30 days, 90 days. It's not for three and five years like it used to be. So change is the law of life, and those who look up into the past or present are certain to miss the future. And I just challenge you that as you're out of the workplace, change is inevitable. Learn to love it. Learn to embrace it. Learn to do it as well as you can, because healthcare is changing every single day. Um, we provide your medical coverage, um, and that's something that you all could do as a group for like $40 a person. So if you're ever flown, you never get a bill. So we're talking twenty, thirty thousand dollars to fly on an aircraft, even with insurance sometimes. So that's something that we could always talk about and I could give you all information about that you all could do as a group if you chose to. Just another way to cover you. Any questions? Yes. That's what we do. 
do that to Matt Kessel. He has to get that we're working with our consulting county health department, all of us. Well, um, they are transporting about 70 or more county patients now um, to local hospitals to see how they can take care of the surge of patients. And we'll have an aircraft stationary there, and then I'll be there kind of working up all the mathematics of you know, how long this aircraft will take to get there and take them to the hospital and all of that. So, so what's your most rewarding story? So you've been doing this for a while. Clearly, there's been a lot of the other times where you may have helped someone that would probably die otherwise. Do you have any story like that that you would really share? Um, gosh, there's, there's so many every time. And then, unfortunately, it's our everyday work, so a lot of the stories you kind of forget. I don't mean that as an arrogance, just to get used to taking care of those patients. Um, one of the most rewarding as far as EMS doing the job that they should do allowing the asset to be there for who it should be there for. Um, we were called to McKinney County many years ago. We were hovering over a head and they decided the patient doesn't need you. Thank God. So they canceled us. Simultaneously, we get a request for a little girl running behind us. Um, so we were so close that we were able 10 minutes and we were there. So that was very rewarding because that child probably would be with us because we were able to provide that immediate care to her much faster than what we could have from the base. She wouldn't have had the care had they not canceled us, so we were able to transfer her to where she could go. So that, that is absolutely one of the most rewarding. You know our heart attack patients that you're taking, and you know, we had one two days ago that the crew was telling me kept um, arresting, and they could dribble away. This is from like 10 or 12 times as they were flying. And they were able to get him to the cath lab. He refused to even live today. And had we not done that, he had the speed to get to the cath lab to get the medical assistance. He probably wouldn't have survived. So, um, you know, those, those are things that we see on a daily basis that kind of what we do, unfortunately.
can sign that. I will sign it any graduate. Oh, you're welcome, 